Okay, now that we've taken a look at our determinants of demand, let's talk about, in particular, our sensitivities. And what we're going to be taking a look at first in terms of our sensitivities is how sensitive is our quantity demanded to a change in price. That is, if you want to take a look at that, let's say that we have a demand curve. So we'll have our demand curve, we have our price, we have our quantity, and then we have demand. First determinant that we looked at was change in own price. So let's presume that we have a, let's try that again. We have a price there giving us this quantity. And then our price changes our price, let's say our price falls. And given this falling price, we have our updated quantity. So some change in price, in this case here, we have a negative change in price, the price was falling, causing some change in our quantity demanded, such that our quantity demanded was rising. And we want to look at different measures that we have for this sensitivity and work through what these are. So the first sensitivity that we're going to be taking a look at is our marginal effect. And what the marginal effect is, is it's figuring out, okay, what is, by how much does my quantity demand change for a change in the price of a dollar? So that is our marginal effect can be measured as the change in my quantity demanded for a change in the price, right? And keep in mind, just like when we were talking about opportunity costs, the denominator, this is always our incremental change. This is our plus or minus one, right? So essentially it's saying, hey, dollar, we are, sorry, our price went up by $1. By how much does our quantity demanded then change by? And we can work this out quite easily, actually. If we go back, let's say that this is like that demand curve we were working at before. So that was 30. This is 15. So that is we had, uh, let me back up. That was price equals 30 minus 2 quantity demanded. Well, we could work out this marginal effect as, well, hey, let's take a look at this. What's our slope? Right, our slope of this line, you're like, oh, okay, that's not bad. Slope is negative two. But okay, negative two what? We did rise over run, so that was change in price over change in quantity. Okay, that's, that, that's neat. What are we looking for, though? We're looking for change in quantity over change in price. So very easily I can get my marginal effect as the inverse of my slope. So okay, if I have a slope, and again, slope of my marginal benefit or willingness to pay curve would be two, and my marginal effect then would be one half, quantity demanded per dollar, meaning every time the dollar changes by plus one, I will consume, or maybe maybe that's not the right word, maybe not consume, uh, my quantity demanded will fall by a half unit. Right? And all we did to get that is we just took the inverse of our slope. 1 over negative 2. And instead of price per quantity, I would have quantity per price. And okay, in this case here, yay, I get my marginal effect. Every change in the price of a dollar causes change in the number of units demanded by one half unit. So there we go. We can work out our marginal effect in this way here. Marginal effects are great. They give us kind of an insight as to what this rate of change is between price and quantity but they have their shortcomings, right? And they have their shortcomings in, okay, change in the price of a dollar. 
Is this change in the price of a dollar, is this a big change? Or is that a small change? What about this change in quantity demanded by a half unit? Is that a big change in our consumption? Or is that a small change in our consumption? Right? Unfortunately, we don't actually have that information. And let's let's take a look at what I mean by that. So, okay, by one by a half. So let's go and say that price, price went and gets changed from, um, we'll go P0 to P1. Price changes from 500 to 500,001 dollar. All right, that was plus one dollar in the price. Is that a big change or is that a tiny change? All right, in this case here, five hundred thousand dollars to five hundred thousand and one dollar. That would be a small change in our price, right? Very, very small. But we could look at another case. Price of candy, let's say price of candy went from 50 cents to $1.50. Again, we've only had plus $1, but this plus $1, what is this? Well, in this case here, right, this is actually quite a large change in the price of candy. That's actually a very large change in the price of candy. So while the marginal effect is nice because it tells us, okay, every time the price changes by a dollar or quantity demand, it changes by half a unit or whatever that inverse of the slope might be, it fails to tell us the scale of this change. That is, are we dealing with a large change in price or just a tiny change in price? And that's our big problem here that we need to consider. Right, we can do the same thing on quantity demanded, right? In this case here, maybe our initial quantity demanded, uh, quantity demanded initial, maybe initially we had something like 100,000 units being bought and sold, and then now we have, given this change, we now have what? Point five fewer, right? Again, that is negative one half. Price went up by a dollar. Quantity demand went dropped by one half. That there could be a huge, sorry, one half change because of our huge number of quantity change and a half. Again, that's a small impact, right? Not very much actually changing in terms of quantity demanded. Same thing though over here, we could look at quantity demanded of coffee or candy and how that changed. Let's presume that this was initially two and now 1.5. Well, okay, again, this is a change of negative one half, but in terms of the scale of this change, this is relatively large. So, both of these, right, both of these situations, both of you were talking about real estate or candy, we would get a marginal effect of negative one half quantity demanded per dollar. Negative one half quantity demanded per dollar. Identical marginal effect. But as we can see, the scale of these changes, the sensitivity of these changes is actually very, very different. So while the marginal effect is useful, while the marginal effect helps to give us an insight as to what's happening, it's not the full picture. And what we really need in order to overcome this scale difference is we need to introduce a new concept, a new measure of sensitivity. And this one here is known as elasticity. And what this elasticity is, is another way that we can measure how sensitive is our quantity demanded of one good given a change in the price? 
And let's take a look at what this elasticity is. So again, our marginal effect, ME, that was saying, okay, what is the change in my quantity demanded for a change in my price? My elasticity of demand, we'll notate this as eta D. So kind of like an N with a long tail. That's the Greek letter eta. Don't need to know that other than we use that to denote elasticity. A to D is going to be the absolute value of the percent change in quantity demanded all over the percent change in price. Right? And in this case here, we can take a look at how much has changed in terms of percentage. That is, are we looking at a big percent change in it or just a tiny percent change in it? And based on how this works out, we're going to get our measurement of elasticity and thus our measurement of sensitivity. That's really what we're measuring. This elasticity term loses a lot of students. By elasticity, we mean sensitivity. How sensitive are we to a percent change in the price? And let's take a look at an example of this. Let's look at a case where we have, we'll look at a few different goods and we'll take a look, price in dollars, we'll take a look at the initial price, the after price, and thus what the change in price was. And to start off with the first good, let's say we started off at a price of nine and we ended up at 11. So, okay, that was a change of price of plus $2. Take a look at another one, and we'll say that it was initially 99 up to 101. So again, a change in price of $2. Okay, we can give some context to this. Maybe this first guy here, maybe this is t-shirts. Maybe this second guy here, I don't know, maybe this is coffee machines, right? Maybe some cheap little coffee machines. Okay. And in both cases, we have had a change in price of $2. So going and taking a look at our quantity demanded, we'd have our quantity demanded initial, our quantity demanded after, and then the change in quantity demanded. So let's say that initially with t-shirts, we had something like, I don't know, let's say we had initially something like, 105 t-shirts being bought and sold, or being demanded rather. And okay, price went up. Law of demand is price up, quantity demanded down. So our quantity demanded fell to 95. That is, what do we have for our change in quantity demand? Our change in quantity demand was negative 10. 105 minus 95. Let's take a look at coffee machines. In the case of our coffee machine, let's presume that, okay, t-shirts, lots of t-shirts are bought and sold. In this case here, let's say that we went from, I don't know, let's say from 35 down to 25. So again, negative 10. Okay, to work through all this, right, the reason why I did it in this way is because again, to demonstrate, if we worked through our marginal effect for each case, change in quantity demand for change in price, in both cases, we get 10 over two. We get what, negative 10 over two. We would get negative five units per dollar. Right, so that would be saying every time that the price went up by one dollar, our quantity demanded fell by five. And we have the exact same marginal effect in both cases here. But, okay, what about the elasticity? What about this other method of sensitivity? Well, in order to figure out the elasticity, we don't just want the change in quantity demanded and the change in price. We want this percent change, this percent change. And so let's take a look at how we calculate this. So, percent change, and let's just use a generic variable x. Percent change in x. Typically, the way that you would find this is you would take your final value, so um, x1, minus your initial value, 
x naught, right? So if this was p, that'd be p1 minus p naught. And then you would divide it by your initial value. And then if you need it as an actual value, you would times it by 100%, or you could keep it as a decimal between 0 and whatever value we have. So that's how we would typically find percentages. That's how, if you've ever done percentages up until this point, this is probably how you've done it. This is not how we're going to do it, right? This is not how we're going to find the percent change in quantity, the percent change in price. The way that we're going to do it, uh, actually all we'd have to change is this bottom guy here. The way that we're going to do it is we're going to take the initial value, we're going to subtract it, sorry, we're going to get the final value subtracted from the initial, so P1 minus P0, and then we're going to divide it by the average value. Right, where the average value, if we were looking at, again, everything's just generically in terms of x's, so x bar, that would be x1 plus x0 all over 2. We'd find the average of the two that we're comparing, and then we would times that by 100. And let's, let's work out as to why, why we would do it this way versus the way that you would traditionally see. And in order to do that, let's just use a very, very simple example. And we'll come back to this. Let's just scroll down and take a look at a quick example here. Let's suppose we wanted to know what the percent change of x was. And we had an initial value of x of 1 and a final value of x of 2. Okay? So if we used our traditional method, not this one, but our traditional method, we would say, okay, percent change in x is... 2 minus 1 all over 1, 1 over 1, and then times 100, that's going to give me a 100% change. Cool. Great. But here's the problem. What if, what if we didn't actually know the direction? What if we didn't know that we were going from 1 to 2? What if we didn't know that price was going from 9 to 11? What if it was going the other way? What if we went from 11 to 9? Right? Keep in mind, if we had a line, we went 11 to 9, this would be negative 2. We'd be going from 95 to 105, so that'd be plus 10. I'd still get a marginal effect of negative 5. It'd just be going the opposite direction. Instead of 9 to $11, I'm going 11 to $9. So what would happen here? If instead of going from 1 to 2, I went from 2 to 1, well percent change in x in that case, if I started off at 1, sorry, if I started off at 2 and went to 1, 1 minus 2 all over 2, 1 minus 2, that's negative 1 over 2, that's negative 1 half, that's negative 50%. Here's the problem. As we change, what is the percent difference between 1 and 2? Is it a 100% difference or is it a 50% difference? Well, okay, it's a 100% increase, it's a 50% decrease, but the problem is, let's view it graphically. Okay, so we have our graph, we have our price, we have our quantity. There's my demand curve, demand, Let's suppose, right, just taking a look at t-shirts. Suppose I want to know my sensitivity between these two points. 11, 9, 95, and 105. Right, so I want to know, hey, what is my elasticity of demand between these two points? In fact, in this case here, I'm not actually even saying, hey, we started off at 9 and we went up to 11. I'm not saying we started at 11 and went down to 9. I have no implicit or explicit statement of direction. I'm just saying, what is my sensitivity between these two points? Well, you can work out the marginal effect, right? You can work out the marginal effect without any direction, and you would just get negative 5. But Problem is elasticity. Problem is this percent change. 
right? Percent change kind of depends on direction. Well, how do we overcome this problem? With that guy, right? This average value of X. And let's take a look at why that works. So if we come down here again, two minus one divided by the average value. So, okay, two minus one, what's our average there? So you would add the two together, divided by two. So two plus one is three. Three divided by two is 1.5. We would have one over 1.5. What does that work out to? One over 1.5 would be 0 0.667 or 66.67%. Okay. On the other side, one minus two over the average, the average would be the same, 1.5. You'd get negative one over 1.5 is negative 0 0.667 or negative 66.67%. Here we notice we get the same value for a percent change. It's just the sign that's different, right? Here was a 66.67% increase versus a 66.67% decrease. This is the problem that we overcome by using this average, and thus it is why we'll use an average every time we're trying to find the percent change in price, the percent change in quantity demanded. So let's take a look at working that through. Let's take a look at that. Let's just make some room here. Okay, so we wanna find the percent change of our price, we want to find the percent change in our quantity demanded so we can work out this elasticity formula. You'll notice we have this absolute value here. That's because we know this is going to be negative. Law of demand, if price goes up, quantity demand comes down. They're always going to move in inverse direction, so this is always going to give us a negative result. We don't care. We know it's going to be negative. We just want to record the positive value. And that's what this absolute value sign means, just these line brackets. It's saying, cool, we don't care about the sign. We just want the magnitude, we just want the number. So to do that, let's start off by working out our percent change in price. So what do we have for prices? We have nine, we have 11, right? We're trying to find what is our percent change in price between these two guys. So, okay, let's go uh, percent change in price is, 11 minus nine all over, not over nine, over our average. So 11 plus nine is 20, 20 divided by two is 10. So what is that gonna be? 11 minus nine is two over 10. That's gonna be 20%. Now, okay, in this formula, really the way that we want to record this is we want to record this as the decimal equivalent. So that is without doing the times 100, 2 over 10, 0 0.20. This is the value we'd want to utilize for this percent change in price. What about quantity? What do we have here going on for quantity? Well, let's work out that guy. We have 95 and 105, we're working out the percent change in our quantity demanded. So, percent change in the quantity demanded is, we can go 105 minus 95 all over the average. So, okay, 95 plus 105 is 200. 200 divided by two is 100. What do we have here? Well, that's going to be 10 over 100, or 0.10, 10%. So, okay, we work that out. We can work out, then, our elasticity of demand. Elasticity of demand is percent change quantity demanded for a percent change in the price. And that's going to work out to... 0 0.10 all over 0.5. gives me 0.5. Woo! We've solved our elasticity of demand. Cool. What does it mean? What does it tell us, right? 
it's like we did a bunch of math great but it's important to backtrack and say okay great what is this math actually telling us what does the math mean okay what the math means in this case the math is getting at for a one percent for a one percent change in price we will witness a percent change in quantity demanded. So for a 1% change in the price, we're going to witness a 0.5% change in the quantity demanded. A okay, big thing with that, big thing that really we're going to be taking a look at with this is to say, hey, this guy changes a little bit. This guy changes relatively more, right? We have a bigger value in the denominator than we have in the numerator. So percent change in price is bigger than my percent change in quantity demanded. That is, quantity demanded is not very sensitive to a change in price, right? We can say 20%, that's relatively large. 10%, that's relatively small. 10 is smaller than 20, right? So, okay, small change in quantity for a big change in price. I would say that I'm not very sensitive, right? Or to put it in the terms as to how we would actually be interested in, I would say that I am inelastic. Inelastic. I am not very sensitive to a change in price. Huge change in price, right? 20% change in price. But not very much happened here in my quantity demanded. Only a 10% fall. So, okay, inelastic in that case. What about our coffee machines? Let's take a look at what's happening with our coffee machines. So in this case here, we have price of 99 to 101, and we have coffee machines from 35 down to 25. Let's take a look at that. So we had, this was for our coffee machines. I'm just carrying forward the information so we can look at that. 99 to 101. And then we had quantity demanded not, quantity demanded one. And what do we do? Price went up, quantity went down from 35 to 25. Okay, let's work out our percent change quantity demanded first. What do we have? We have 25 minus 35 all over our average there. So what is that? That's going to be 25 plus 35. That's going to be 60. 60 divided by 2 is 30. Okay, so final minus initial divided by average. What do I get? That's going to be negative 10 all over 30. That's going to be one third. 0. 0.5. Three, 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 repeating. Okay. Oh, I dropped my negative, right? Technically, this is negative 0 0.333 repeating. In fact, I probably dropped my negative up here too. I did, right? That's okay. Given elasticity, we can, and okay, many would disagree, and truthfully, I would disagree with myself as well. It's not okay to be sloppy, but elasticity, we can be because we don't care about the negatives. We're just interested in the magnitude. So we're just interested in the absolute value. Hence why I do get sloppy with this and I allow just everything to be positive. But yeah, technically it's negative, but then the final answer works out to be positive. So we're fine. We can kind of wave our hands with that. What about my percent change in price, right? So this was, I want to think about it, a 33% drop in my quantity demanded. What about my price? Change in price was from 99 to 101. So 101 minus 99, the average there, 101 plus 99 is 200. 200 divided by two is 100. So that's two over 100. That's 0 0.02 or a 2% increase in price. Okay, what we see here now, when I compare, change in price to change in quantity, this is relatively small, right? 
2% is smaller than 33%. So small change in price, and we witness a big or a large change in our quantity demanded. That is, even without calculating this, I can just look at this and go, wow, this is sensitive. This is very sensitive. We hardly had a change in the price, and our quantity demanded is reacting huge to that. Okay, okay, so given that's the case, elasticity of demand, percent change quantity demanded to a percent change in price, Right, okay, so 0 0.33, negative 0 0.3333 divided by 0 0.02. What, uh, what does that give me? Well, 0 0.33333 repeating, that's one third divided by 0 0.02 is going to give me a value of 16.66, on, 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 we'll go 16.667. Right, so in this case here, what we're witnessing. Again, small change in price. Our quantity demanded is changing by a large amount, relatively speaking. I would say that I am sensitive to changes in price. That is, to use the language of economics in this case, if I'm sensitive to this change in price, I am elastic. Elastic would be to be sensitive to price changes. Let's, let's compare and contrast quickly. So a value of 16.67, a value of 0.5, right? 0.5 was a big change in price, small change in quantity demanded. My quantity demanded was not very sensitive. Down here, tiny change in price, large change in my quantity demanded. I am sensitive, right? And we could have the same kind of interpretation. We said, hey, for a 1% change in price, we will witness a... A to D, percent change in quantity demanded. Same idea. For a 1% change in the price, we would witness a 16.67% change in my quantity demanded. So every time price changes by 1%, my quantity demanded would change by 16.67%. Quite, quite sensitive, right? Very sensitive in that case. We can, we can kind of generalize our possible results for elasticity then. We could build a table of possible elasticity results. And I really, every time I draw this table, I really get hesitant to do so because really you should be thinking about what's happening here. Hey, large impact for a small, I am sensitive because this guy's big. But many of you will just memorize this table and I guarantee you it will mess you up in the long run because we'll look at other elasticities that don't revolve around the same points. And then you'll get confused. Oh, is this elasticity around zero? Is this elasticity around one? What's going on? So, okay, really focus on what's happening, what we're measuring, right? Which is a small change in price, big change in quantity demanded, sensitive. Large change in price, tiny change in elastic, or tiny change in quantity demanded, insensitive or inelastic. But just the same, we could say that, okay, if we get a value of elasticity, that is between, uh, let's back that up. That is bigger than zero, but less than one, we would say that that is inelastic. If we get an elasticity of demand that is equal to one, we would say that that is unit elastic. And if we think about that, that means that we would say have a 50% change in our quantity demanded or a 50% change in our price. It's a one for one trade off, right? They're changing at the exact same rates. Carrying on down, we could also have an elasticity of demand greater than one. And that is our elastic or sensitive, right? And that's what we had here. Large change in quantity for a tiny change in price, giving us a sensitive good or an elastic good. We have some extreme cases as well. We could have a case where our elasticity of demand is equal to zero. 
in which case we would say that we are perfectly inelastic. This is a case where we have no sensitivity at all. Price could balloon, price could skyrocket, we could have a 1,000% change in the price. And we would keep buying the exact same amount of quantity. Quantity is completely unfazed by the price in this case. So extreme case, yes, but technically could exist. Other extreme, we could have an elasticity of demand of infinity. And we would call this perfectly elastic. And in this case here, if the price is some value, cool. If the price increases by even a tiny little bit, so price goes up by one cent, quantity demand goes all the way to zero. On the other extreme, price drops by one cent, and the quantity demanded shoots all the way out to infinity, right? This would be a super, super sensitive quantity demand. If we wanted to kind of take a look as to what these would look like in each of these extreme cases, we could. So, okay, we would have in this case price quantity. A perfectly inelastic demand curve would be vertical. It would be absolutely vertical. It doesn't matter what this price does, it's always going to read off the same quantity. Meanwhile, perfectly elastic demand curve, what is that guy going to look like? Well, we'd have price, we'd have quantity, and in this case here, we would have a horizontal. Oh, that's not horizontal, it shifted down to the last second. We would have a, ah, pretend that's horizontal, it keeps shifting down on me. Horizontal line, such that if we deviate at all from this price, up or down, if we go up, quantity would drop down to zero. If we went down, quantity would shoot all the way out to infinity. In between, we would have varying degrees of elasticity, and relatively speaking, the demand curve would be steeper or shallower. And again, I really want to emphasize that, relatively speaking, because we'll take a look shortly that any linear demand curve will have all three portions along it. It'll have an inelastic stretch, a unit elastic stretch, and an elastic stretch. But we'll get there in a bit. We have another way that we could also express elasticity. And that is, okay, we have our elasticity of demand is our percent change in the quantity demanded for a percent change in price. Okay, just want to caution you, just want to warn you right now. I'm about to go through a bit of algebra. I'm about to get from one expression of this formula to another expression of this formula. Do not get caught up with the algebraic manipulation. I'm never going to ask you to move from one to the other. This is just to show that they're both identical and just another way that we can express this. So let's take a look at that. So, hey, percent change quantity demanded. Well, percent change quantity demanded, that is the change in quantity demanded all over my average quantity demanded. And I got a little bit too excited with how far I drew that out there. And then very similarly, percent change in price, that's my change in price all over my average price. Okay, looks ugly, right? Doesn't look like we've done anything to help. But what we've now done, we have a fraction divided by a fraction. We should be familiar with doing this. Our trick in this case is to take the denominator, flip it, and multiply the two together. So we would have the percent, sorry, not the percent, just the change in quantity demanded all over our average quantity demanded times our average price all over the change in price. Okay. Hey. Change in quantity demanded times P bar is the same thing as P bar times the quantity demanded. So we could just move around the numerator, move around the denominator without any loss. And what we can get is we can get change in quantity demanded all over change in price times P bar all over 
quantity demanded bar. And this here, algebraically identical way of expressing elasticity. This here at times can make it mathematically a lot easier to calculate. But although it can make it a lot easier to mathematically calculate, I find this less of an intu less intuitive way to display this function. Right? In this case here, I can just look at, hey, what's the value of this number? What's the value of that number? If the top is bigger, we're elastic. If the bottom is bigger, we're inelastic. Again, elastic sensitive, inelastic not sensitive. In this case, I don't have that same interpretation popping out. I just would have my end value and I'd have to interpret that. Hey, is it bigger than one? Great, I'm sensitive. Is it less than one? Okay, I'm not sensitive. Why would this be one that we'd want to utilize though? Well, the reason why this is a functional form that sometimes is nice to work with is because of this guy here. Change in quantity demanded over change in price. What, what is that? Well, that there is my marginal effect, right? That's my marginal effect right there. And if I have, whoop, if I have a function that is in this way, 30 minus two quantity demanded, well, that too, this slope in our typical way of price as a function of quantity demanded, this slope is rise over run, change in price over change in quantity demanded. So that is, I can just take one over this slope and get my marginal effect. And then once I have that, hey, that's gonna be constant along the entire line. If I need to calculate more than one elasticity, if I want to take a look at the elasticity at a few different points, all I need to worry about is my average price and my average quantity demanded between those different points. So at times, if I know the formulatic expression of the line, this can be an easier functional form to utilize. If not, right, either one will give you the exact same answer. You can use either form, but just to show you two different expressions for the elasticity of demand. Two different ways we could calculate them. Okay, let's take a look at here another example here. We have a demand curve represented by price equals 100 minus QD. Now keep in mind typically when we're going through mathematical expression, we don't write it, but technically this is a slope of one times quantity demanded. We typically don't write that one when it's there, it's just implicitly assumed, but we could add it just for clarification in this case here. So what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to evaluate what is the elasticity of demand at these three different arcs along our demand curve. We wanna take a look at the elasticity of demand along this yellow section as price is between 95 and 85 and our quantity demand is between five and 15. We then want to do the same for the blue section and then the same for the green section. So to start off with the yellow section, what I'm going to do for the first one here is calculate it both ways, right? We took a look at two different formulas for calculating elasticity. We'll take a look at how to calculate this in both ways here and then same idea and well, we'll do one for this guy and one for that guy just to speed up the process. So to start off, elasticity of demand we are looking at the percent change in our quantity demanded for a percent change in price. So, okay, using this format here, percent change in quantity demanded, let's go over here and work that out. Percent change quantity demanded, that would be 15 minus five divided by the average of the two. So five plus 15 is 20, 20 divided by two is 10. And I would have, what, 10 over 10, giving me one. So 100% change in my quantity demanded. Percent change in price, what do I have there? Well, I'm going to have, what did I do? I did 15 to 5, so that'd be 85 to 95. What do I have all together? Well, 85 and 95 gives me 180. 180 divided by 2 
gives me 90. So my average would be 90. What do I get? Negative 10 over 90, that'd be negative 0 0.111 repeating. So 1 over 9, if we were to express it in fractional form. To then get my elasticity of demand, I would have 1 over 0 0.11111. And so I would have an elasticity of 1 divided by 0 0.1111. That's going to give me approximately 9. Right? If I did just 1 divided by 1 over 9, I would get exactly 9. Depending on how many decimals you carry there, it's going to work out to roughly 9, like 8.999 or 9.00 something. So we get approximately 9. To show us that we could also do this the other way, that is, we could take a look at our marginal effect times the average price all over the average quantity demanded. Let's work through that. So our marginal effect, keep in mind, this guy here is just going to be the inverse of our slope. In this case, we're lucky, our slope is 1. So the inverse of 1, 1 over 1, is just 1. Cool. So we would have 1 times the average price well, okay, we worked that out. The average price, that was 90. All over our average quantity demanded, we worked that out as well. That's 10. So 1 times 90 over 10, that is 9. So again, in this case here, we have a value of our elasticity of 9. Again, start to think about this. We got math, we got a number. Great. What does it mean? Well, in this case here, an elasticity of 9, that's a value bigger than 1. To get that, that means we've had a big change in quantity demanded. For a tiny change in price, we are elastic. We are sensitive. So we are price sensitive up in this region here. As we carry on down, because I know the slope, I'm going to utilize this formula that is because I now know it's just 1 times my average price divided by my average quantity. So, okay, what's my average price? 55 plus 45, that gives me 100. 100 divided by 2 is 50. Okay, same idea here. Average quantity demanded. So 45 plus 50, oh, that's 100 as well, divided by, oh, that's 50 as well. What do I get there? I get an elasticity of 1. Meaning, again, right, this doesn't pop out as cleanly as it does in this expression, but an elasticity of 1 means that I have the exact same percent change in each. Say a 50% change in price, yielding a 50% change in my quantity demanded. So in that case there, I am unit elastic. Carrying on down, what do we have here? Well, okay, we have our slope of 1, or inverse slope of 1, rather. And then I'm going to have my average price. Well, what's my average price? Between 15 and 5, so 15 plus 5 is 20. 20 divided by 2 is 10. And then what do I have on the denominator? My average quantity. Average between 85 and 95, well, 85 plus 95 is 180, divided by 2, that's 90. 10 over 90 gives me 0 0.111 repeating. That is, okay, in this case here, 0 0.111 means that for some change in price, I'm getting a relatively small change in quantity demanded, meaning that I am in elastic. So in elastic unit elastic and then up on the top I was elastic. So what we find even though along a linear line the marginal effect marginal effect marginal effect marginal effect or slope is identical everywhere along this line Despite that fact, we find that the elasticity varies as we move down the line, such that for every 
every linear demand curve, every linear demand curve can ultimately be decomposed into its three parts. We can have price, quantity, let's get the demand curve drawn here. Okay. We can have for every linear demand curve, some stretch up along the top, it's going to be elastic. We'll then have a point as we go down where we are unit elastic. And then finally, we'll have a stretch along the bottom where we are inelastic. So every demand curve will have these three components to it, an elastic section, a unit elastic section, and an inelastic section. And it seems like, oh, okay, yay, that's good information. It turns out this is crucial information as we carry on. This is a, um, an outcome that we can really manipulate for ourselves as we carry on to get some really interesting results and interesting analysis from our curves. And we'll take a look at that shortly as we carry on through this course. Probably once we get into this whole supply and demand and full market, this whole idea of varying elasticity will come back to us. Right now, though, let's take a look at one quick kind of outcome that we can get away from this, and that's going to be the relationship between total expenditure and elasticity. And let's take a look. Let's go back up here. Let's go back up here. So total expenditure, let's write this down. Total expenditure is just the total amount that I'm expending on what I'm buying. So for example, if I were to buy five units at a price of $95 a unit, how much money am I expending altogether? Well, $95 per unit times five units, I get a total expenditure of 475. If we think about this in a geometric kind of way, what we've just done is we've said, okay, five, uh, let's pick a color for this. Five, that is my base here. 95, that is my height. Base times height, that's just the area of a rectangle. That is all of this here. All of that there is my total expenditure on this good, this area of this rectangle that we just worked out. Five times 95. Well, what happens? What happens as the price falls? As the price falls, we know that my quantity demanded goes up, but what happens to my total expenditure? Does my total expenditure go up? Do I end up just buying, spending more money on this altogether? Or does my total expenditure drop? Well, let's, let's take a look at this. Well, okay, price drops. So price drops from 95 down to 85. Well, what happens now? We have 85. We have now 15 being consumed at that, right? 85, 15. We're taking a look now at this. Bit. What does that give me? 85 times 15 gives me now 1275. So, okay, again, if we're taking a look at what we just calculated, that there is now going to be, let's get rid of that top bit, that's now going to be all of this. That I'm expending, right? This double bit. So if we think about it, we've gained, let's go, we've gained this box. Red on yellow does not necessarily work. Now most colors on yellow aren't really going to work. We've gained this box here and we've lost this box there. So hey, we've gained a lot more than we've lost. Our total expenditure has gone up. So as price went down, total expenditure went up. Okay, cool. 
Now, is this consistent? Does this carry on as we go through this entire bit? Well, let's, let's evaluate. Let's take a look. Let's go to the other extreme. Let's jump down over here to the 15 and 5. So, okay, what did we have? When I was buying 85 units and paying $15 per unit, well, what was my total expenditure? Well, okay. I had uh, $15 per unit, consuming 85, right? That's these guys. What is that? 15 times 85, that gives me, oh, that gives me 1275 again. Okay, and again, if we want to think about it geometrically, we are, let's make this maybe a bit thicker. We are doing all of this rectangle. Right, all of this guy here, that would be the area we just calculated, base of 85 times a height of 15. Now what happens, now what happens is price goes down. Well, price goes down, my quantity demanded will go up. What happens to my total expenditure? Over here we said, hey, price down, quantity up, total expenditure up. Can we assume the same thing? Well, let's calculate it. Price down. So, okay, price from 15 down to 5. Quantity demanded up from 85 up to 95. What's happened to my total expenditure? My total expenditure is now 475. Oh no, right in this case, my total expenditure has actually fallen as the price has fallen. So, okay, we have two very conflicting results here. Over in our first example we looked at, price went down and total expenditure went up. Now we have price going down and total expenditure going down. What's, what's happening? What's, what's causing this distinction? What's causing the difference here? Well, what's causing the difference between these two scenarios is the elasticity. And it turns out, it turns out that when you are elastic, so greater than one, you have this inverse relationship between price and total expenditure. Or to put it another way, you have a positive relationship between your quantity and total expenditure. Once you come over here, and once you get an inelastic situation, so in the green case there, well now we get a positive relationship between price and total expenditure, or an inverse between our quantity demanded, right? So quantity demanded, quantity demanded and total expenditure. So relationship between the two. We could look at this, right, one final way. We could draw our demand curve yet again. And what I'm going to want to do is right under this demand curve, draw a second graph that is going to share the same horizontal axes. So that's quantity, that's quantity. This is price. This guy is going to be my total expenditure, right? Total expenditure, keep in mind, all that is is price times quantity. Okay, demand curve. Coming down like that. We have initially up high, we have our elastic zone. We then have some point, if it's a unit slope, unit elasticity will be in the middle. It doesn't always have to be in the middle though. And then we will have over here our inelastic section. So again, let's just keep in mind, greater than one, that is elastic. That means we're sensitive to the price. And over here, less than one, we are inelastic. We are not sensitive to the price. Carry this guy down. Probably could have just used the line tool, would have made it a little bit cleaner, but we get our idea.
What we'll notice, right, if we go up and take a look, what did we say? We're taking a look at quantity, the relationship between quantity and total expenditure. In this elastic zone, so hey, let's just color coordinate a little bit here. In our elastic zone, and what do we have for the other side? Our inelastic zone, right? And then we had our point where it cut off altogether. All right, that's like all of a sudden our quantity is as high as it is, but the price is zero. So if price is zero, total expenditure is zero. So that's our other extreme right there, that red dotted line. So in the elastic zone, the yellow bit, what do we say? Quantity and total expenditure are positively related. As quantity goes up, total expenditure goes up. Meanwhile, in our inelastic zone, quantity went up, total expenditure went down. Okay. The way that this actually ends up looking, let's see how well I can do it given these tools, is it's a parabola. So it's going to rise up. It's going to hit a maximum right at our unit elastic point. And then it's going to start to fall. Like such. Should be symmetric, right? I'm freehanding. It's not perfectly symmetric, but we would have that relationship between quantity and total expenditure such that this relationship is entirely driven by the elasticity of our demand curve. Entirely driven by the elasticity of our demand curve. Okay. Why is this useful? Why is this something that we might want to know that we might want to be interested in? Well, let's take a look at an example as to how this goes through. And let's suppose that Tim Hortons, right? So we can write this through. Tim Hortons are a good old classic Canadian, although not Canadian anymore, uh, Canadian coffee shop. Tim Hortons, they because of they're trying to maximize their profit and let's say they're trying to increase their revenue in order to get more profit. And so they are taking a look at, they are wanting to increase their price of coffee from say $2 for medium up to $2.50. Now, say they've done extensive studies and they've determined that the elasticity of demand for their coffee is something like 0 0.8. So that is a pretty inelastic demand. People want their coffee and they're going to continue to buy their coffee really given the price. Inelastic. Our quantity demanded is not very sensitive to the price. What we want to know is that if, if Tim Hortons goes through with this price change, What's going to happen to their total revenue? Are they going to be making more money or are they going to be making less money? And here you might be confused for a second. You might be like, wait, what? Keith, total revenue? We were just talking about total expenditure. Well, okay, keep in mind from our producer theory, total revenue is just price times quantity. Total expenditure is just price times quantity. They're both the same thing, just from another perspective. Your total expenditure on coffee is the firm's total revenue from you on coffee. So the market's total expenditure on coffee is thus the market's total revenue earned from coffee, right? There's two flip sides of the same coin. Okay, so we have all of our information. What is going to happen to our total revenue? Well, first thing, we need to identify what do we have here for elasticity? Are we elastic? unit elastic or in elastic and right we've already talked about this 0 0.8 this is an in elastic demand so okay we can identify that right away we can say yeah we are over in this green section here where we are in elastic okay that's that's useful because then we know which zone we're playing with now what we need to do is we need to take a look and say, well, we're looking at quantity versus total expenditure or total revenue. Uh, we have price. Uh-oh. Well, okay, don't, don't fret. Keep in mind, we're talking about the demand curve, and the demand curve relates price to quantity. 
So as price goes up, what happens to our quantity demanded? Price goes up, quantity demanded falls. So okay, what is that? What is that going to yield for us? Well, let's pick a point. Suppose we used to be there. Quantity demanded fell. So okay, quantity demanded fell, giving us now this point. What has that done to our total expenditure or total revenue? It's caused our total revenue to go up. So in this case here, should Tim Hortons engage in pushing up the price given this inelastic demand for coffee? Well, by pushing up the price, they can actually increase their revenues. As long as they can increase their revenues faster than their costs, their profits will increase. So yeah, okay, they can go ahead with that. Great, they can do it. What if, what if we change this question a little bit? What if we said instead that the elasticity of demand was 1.8, right? So that is now we have an elastic demand for coffee. Still, same change in the price. What's happened to our total revenue now? Well, I'll see if you can work through that. Same kind of situation, we're just in a different point on the graph. The end result is still price up, quantity down, but in this case, our total revenue will fall. Instead of total revenue rising, as we had in our first case, because we're in the elastic region, an increase in the price means that people are just gonna leave our good for other goods, and our total revenue will actually fall in that scenario. So, relationship between elasticity and revenues expenditure. Okay, we spent a lot of time looking at price elasticity. That really is the big one for the course, the big thing we're gonna be looking at for sensitivity of a curve. We do also have two other elasticities, believe it or not, to consider. Right, and these other elasticities, again, just price sensitivities. We can be looking at the elasticity of income, why in economics is often used to denote income. And what this guy here is looking at is saying, okay, what is my percent change in the quantity demanded of some good or a percent change in income? And again, the idea behind this is very much the same as our changes in price. If all of a sudden I get a raise of $10,000 at work, what does that mean? Is this a big raise? Is this a small raise? Right? If I started off with an income of 30,000, well, that's a big raise, right? All of a sudden, boom, I've gone from 30 to 40,000. If I've started off with an income of 1 million, well, that's not really as big of a deal, right? That's a much smaller increase in my total income. I'm not gonna be as excited about that. Probably still be excited, but not as excited, right? So again, this percent change in income is important. From here, what we're really working, what we're really interested in figuring out is, okay, for this income elasticity, I could be less than zero. I could be between zero and one. And I could be greater than one. All right, keep in mind, I don't have these absolute values around this guy. That is, I could have a value that's negative. That is, I can have a situation where my income has gone up, but I start buying less stuff. I have more money, but I'm buying fewer things. Does that sound familiar? When that happens, we would have an inferior good, right? An inferior good, where our income has gone up and our quantity demanded has fallen. Income up quantity demanded down. We would then have our normal set where income goes up, quantity demanded goes up, or alternatively, income down, quantity demanded down. And that would be these two here, which jointly are normal goods. 
So, right, we've already taken a look okay, at this idea of inferior, this idea of normal goods. We're now just introducing a metric by which we can actually measure it by a way that we can say, hey, how has our income changed? What was the change in our quantity demanded? And through that. You'll notice that we actually have two categories for normal. Why didn't we just say, hey, bigger than zero is normal? Why did we split it up to kind of break around this one? Well, we split it up to break around this one because our first set here between zero and one well, okay, these are positive, income goes up, quantity goes up, but they're not very sensitive, right? This would be like an inelastic bit of this. We're not very sensitive to changes in our income. We would call these necessary goods. And what are some examples of necessary goods? Toilet paper, toothbrush, uh, sorry, toothpaste, right? In this case here, if all of a sudden you get a huge pay raise at work, you're not going to be like, woo, I'm going to load up on toilet paper. I'm going to start buying a ton of toothpaste. No, no, no. Typically, the amount of toothpaste, the amount of toilet paper you buy is going to stay relatively constant. It's not going to be very sensitive to your changes in income. Maybe, right, your income went up a bunch. Maybe you're not going to squeeze out every last little bit from your toothpaste container. So maybe over the course of a year, your toothpaste consumption goes up, but not drastically. So these would be our, necess our necessary goods. They're not going to be very sensitive to changes in income. We would also have then ones that are greater than one. And these are our luxury goods. These are extremely sensitive to our changes in income. right? And this is the case where, hey, we get a 5% raise at work and we go and buy a new car. All of a sudden, we've gone from a one-car household to a two-car household, right? That's a huge increase in our quantity demand for vehicles. Luxury goods, very, very sensitive to these changes in income. How do we calculate it? Exactly the same way as the elasticity of demand, right? Percent change in quantity demanded, quantity demanded one, minus quantity demanded not, all over our average. Percent change in income, what's our final income minus our initial income all over the average income, right? So the exact same way of calculating it as we did for our elasticity of demand. We're not going to be using this guy as much. This is kind of a, hey, this also exists. We'll see a few questions with it for sure, where it's going to say, hey, is this an inferior, necessary, or luxury good? But it's not going to be that, not going to be that intensive. Elasticity of demand is really going to be the focus in intro to micro. We would also have eta xy. What this is, is what would be called a cross price elasticity. And that is going to be, hey, we have some change in the price of good x. How does that influence the quantity demanded of good y? All right, so in this case here, percent change in the quantity demanded of y all over the percent change in the price of x. And this is getting at how sensitive we are to the change in prices of other goods, right? If we're going back to our determinants of demand, this is really what we're measuring, is how sensitive we are to these different determinants. In this case, hey, if my good is coffee, and all of a sudden I have a change in the price of T, well, how sensitive am I to these price changes in T? We worked through, right, earlier on, we worked through, hey, we had a change in the price of T, how does this influence coffee? And we said, hey, these guys are substitutes, and we substitute from one to the other. Well, this would be measuring how sensitive we are as substitutes. And how does this work through? Let's, let's just walk through the example as to how we can figure this out. What did we say? We said, okay, price of T, price of T went up. If price of T goes up, well, the quantity demanded of T went down. We said all oh, this was being done, cetris paribus, so price of coffee was fixed, but quantity demanded of coffee, hey, if I'm having less T, I'm having more coffee, so we have this inverse relation. Keep in mind what we're looking at here is we're looking at the price of T and the quantity 
of coffee. So what we find, right, keep in mind we just worked through, we just said, hey, these guys are substitutes. So if we work through this and we get, hey, some Ross price elasticity greater than zero, that's telling us that these goods are substitutes. And you're like, Keith, how'd you get that that's greater than zero? Well, price of tea went up, quantity of coffee went up. Positive divided by a positive will give me a positive value. If we had the opposite scenario happening, price of tea going down, quantity of tea going up, if I'm doing more tea, I'm doing less coffee, what do we have? Price of tea negative, quantity demanded of coffee negative. Well, a negative divided by a negative, again, gives me a positive value. So anytime I have a cross price elasticity greater than zero, those will be substitutes. The other case then is if I have a cross price elasticity less than zero, so a negative value occurring, these would be complements. Hot dogs, hot dog buns, right? That kind of example there. Within this then, right, substitutes could be from just, just above zero to infinity. The value, the magnitude that you get is how sensitive they are to each other. The bigger the magnitude, the more sensitive they are. Same with complements. The sign tells us they're complements. It's negative. Okay, they're complements. This number tells us how sensitive they are as complements. Do you always buy one for one? Or do you sometimes buy hot dogs without hot dog buns? That would be the comparison we're looking at there. Okay, two quick questions to kind of uh, concrete our understanding of elasticity. And we're going to be taking a look at these other kind of interpretations of elasticity because we'll come back to the demand elasticity because that'll be our focus. So for other two alternative uh, elasticities, let's start off. Let's say that concert tickets, concert tickets, they have an income elasticity of 1.5. What does that tell us about concert tickets? What kind of good are they? Keep in mind, we had three options. They could be inferior. They could be necessary. Or they could be a luxury good. And in this case here, concert tickets with an income elasticity of 1.5. That is, they're going to be relatively sensitive to our income. They're a normal good. They're positive. And within that normal good category, they would be a luxury item. So income elasticity 1.5, luxury item. What about, let's suppose that, as we took a look at in our example, suppose we have a cross price elasticity between coffee and tea of 0 0.25. What does this tell us about coffee and tea? Well, okay, between coffee and tea, Cross price elasticity is going to tell us whether or not it's a substitute or a complement. We need to then interpret this number to figure out which one of these it is. And if we recall, okay, substitutes, they were positive, complements were negative. The magnitude then told us how sensitive we were. So, okay, we have a positive cross price elasticity. So, yes, these are substitutes. Cross price elasticity of 0 0.25, uh, that's in the inelastic area, right? Between 0 and 1, the not so sensitive area. So, yes, coffee and tea are substitutes, but they're not very great substitutes, right? They're not strong substitutes. People aren't running to tea if the price of tea falls. They're not throwing their coffee cups saying, forget it, I'm a tea drinker now. No, no, no. People are more or less staying tea drinkers, staying coffee drinkers. There's just a little bit of substitution happening between the two. So, again, just an interpretation of our income and our cross price elasticities. What we're going to finish off with in our demand or our introduction to demand little video series here, we're going to finish off by taking a look at this idea of our marginal benefit curve, right? So, our three interpretations we had demand, marginal benefit, or maximum willingness to pay. We're going to finish off with this whole marginal benefit or marginal value and that interpretation. So let's take a look at that.
What we can do is with this marginal value or marginal benefit interpretation, we can take a look at a demand curve. So let's just draw a generic demand curve here, price, quantity, and let's put in, oh, let's make actual a line. Let's put in our demand curve. And if we wanted to, we could give this actually like price equals 100 minus Q. Right, again, keep in mind, there's implicitly a one in front of that Q. So, okay, I can work that out. I could say, hey, this value here is 100. And then my other intercept would very similarly be 100. What we can do as we work through this is we can work through, okay, our varying prices. And I did this purposely so it was easy to work through. We could say that, okay, when I have a quantity of, oh, I wanted my line. When I have a quantity of one, what is my marginal benefit? The extra benefit received as I went from zero to one units. Well, as I increase my consumption or my demand from zero to one, I gained $99 worth of value or $99 worth of extra benefit, right? That's why that would be the most that I'd be willing to pay for one unit because that's the monetized value of benefit that I received. As I go up from one to two, well, as I go up from one to two, very similarly to, okay, 100 minus two gives me 98. And I can go on and on and on and on in this way. Why is this, why is this nifty? Well, the reason why this is nice is because I can say, okay, this is my extra benefit, my extra benefit, on and on and on. I could also say, hey, if I were to consume two units, that is I consumed one and then I consumed two, I could work out my total benefit, right? My total benefit. And that is, if I worked out through that, I could say, okay, hey, quantity, zero, one, two, work out my marginal benefit, zero. As I consumed one unit, I gained 99. As I consumed two units, I gained 98. So my total benefit then, well, my total benefit's just the aggregation, zero, 99, uh, what's 99 plus 98? Well, 99 plus 98, that works out to be 197, right? And okay, to view this graphically, that is I received all of this benefit here from that first unit, right? So that's the size of that box. And then the second unit, I received all of this benefit here, so if I was to consume two units, I'm getting 99 from the first, 98 from the second, giving me 197 altogether of total benefit or total value from this good. I could carry on all the way down, right? I could say, um, if I were to consume 50 units, well, 100 minus 50, that gives me price of 50 and thus my marginal benefit, 50. My marginal benefit was 50. And very similarly, I could agree it all the way up and I could work out my total benefit. Now, okay, in this sense here, we've been dealing with a discrete number of quantity, right? Zero, one, two, and if you take a look at it, we would kind of have, this little bit here as like lost dead zone benefit that wasn't actually earned in between, right? We kind of just had these little triangles that kind of cut off and didn't get counted. If you recall back, we actually had an assumption for this, and that was that our quantity consumed was infinitesimally divisible. That is, I could consume 0 0.01 of a unit. I could consume 1.42 of a unit. And that way there, right, my quantities become infinitely precise. And what I could do to find out 
hey, what is my total value of consuming 50 units? I could work that out as the area underneath the demand curve all the way up to 50, right? And if that's the case, rather than just finding all these little boxes and adding them up, I can just find the area of this shape and say, okay, the area of that shape, that's the total value, the total benefit, the monetized value or benefit that I receive from consuming 50 units. And how would we do that, right? How do we get the area of this shape? It looks, it looks pretty ugly. Well, luckily for us, because we're dealing with lines, Everything in this course for geometric shapes can either be broken up into a triangle or a rectangle square. And of course, we can find out the area of each. A rectangle square is just base times height. We've already done this a bunch of times. A triangle, one half base times height. So, okay, we can recognize then that this is just triangle sitting on top of a square or on top of a rectangle. No, no, it is a square. A triangle sitting on top of a square and we could work out the corresponding area. So let's just separate it first. Let's separate it first. I'm going to do green for this triangle. Right, and we could find out this area to start with and to find out that area, well, that's going to be one half base times height. Oh, well, what's my base? 50. So one half 50 times a height of 50 all the way up to 100. That's another 50. So what? One half 50 times 50. That's going to give me an area there of. $1,250. I'm then going to have this little blue box in the bottom. This guy here, this is just base times height. Again, I'm going to have a base of 50. And in this case, I'm going to have a height of 50. So 50 times 50, that gives me what? It gives me 2,500. In this way here, I can work out the total value, the total monetized value or the total monetized benefit that I receive from consuming 50 units. And I get that to be 37, $3,750. So I can work out my total value, my total benefit by aggregating up all of that extra benefit, all of that marginal benefit that I received up until that point that I consumed at. And by doing so, by calculating the area underneath the curve, we can get value. This here actually introduces an interesting concept. This introduces one of the first kind of paradoxes that early philosophers came across when they came and studied economics. And let's take a look at this paradox. This is known as the paradox of value. And what they looked at is they looked at two goods. They looked at diamonds and they looked at water. And they said, okay, between these two goods, which one do you value more? Right? And pretty clearly, everybody is like, yeah, you know what? I value water more than I value diamonds. I need it to live. It's pretty darn important to me. I need water. Diamonds? I could actually live without diamonds, right? It would be okay. But yet, when we looked at it, the price of diamonds is really high. The price of water is extremely low. And this seemed to be paradoxical, right? We value water a lot, but yet our willingness to pay our price of water, the marginal benefit, the marginal value we receive from our last cup of water is exceptionally low. We say we don't really value diamonds, but yet we're willing to pay a lot for diamonds. So 
seems to be rather paradoxical. It's like, wait, wait, you value water, but you're not willing to pay very much for it? Why? What, what's going on here? Well, it seems, it seems pretty confusing. But let's take a look at the demand of each of these goods. Let's start off by taking a look at diamonds. And then we'll take a look at water. So for each, we'll have a price, we'll have a quantity. For diamonds, well, if you want to think about the elasticity in this case here, diamonds, well, you're not really, you don't really need them. You're going to be rather sensitive to the price. If the price drops, you'll be willing to buy more, but you don't need a ton of them. So we'll say that the price goes something, oh, let's use an actual line. We'll say that the price does something like that. And we won't even deal with numbers. We'll just look generically at our diagram. And we'll say such that that is currently our price of diamonds. And at that price, we are currently consuming that quantity. So price, quantity. Water, on the other hand, well, water, typically first cup of water, well, we're really going to want it. We get a lot of benefit from it. And then again, we can kind of even give it a little bit of the same shape here. Difference is, is that the price that we pay for water is pretty close to zero, and we consume a lot of it, or at least we should be. In this case here, we have price and we have quantity. So it seems odd, right? It seems like, hey, we say we value water more, but the price is so low. We say we don't really have a value for diamonds, but yet the price is really high. Hmm. How do we justify this paradox? Well, the way that we justify this paradox is that we recall that this price is the marginal benefit from the last unit consumed. Right? We can also think of this as the marginal value. The marginal value from the last unit consumed. If we wanted to find out the actual value, the total value that we as society receive from diamonds versus water, we can aggregate up all of the benefit received up till the quantity consumed. And if we were to go through that, well, for diamonds, that's going to be, uh, let's use the right tool, underneath this demand curve, all the way up to this quantity. Right? So that's going to be this area here. All of that, that would be my value. Value from diamonds, All right? And we see, okay, we get we get a bit of value from diamonds. High price, boom. That's the benefit. That's the value we receive. What about what about water? Right? Low price. So okay, with that low price, we are now all the way up to our quantity. So all the way up to there. And then now that's going to work out to be uh, all of this is the value I receive from water. All right? So, okay, in this case here, massive amounts of value being received from water. The distinction is, is that the extra value, the marginal value I received from my last unit consumed is low because I'm consuming so much water because it's relatively cheap. Because of that, I get massive amounts of value from water such that my value from water is greater than my value from diamonds, which holds up with what we actually say, like, yeah, we value water more. And in fact, it is the low price here, that low extra benefit we receive from the last cup of water we drink, that really creates this high value achieved. So paradox of value, the ability for us to aggregate underneath our marginal benefit, marginal value curve, all the way up to find our total benefit or total value. And in this case here, able to answer this side of our paradox of value to say, yeah, yeah, no, 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 we actually do value water more and we can quantify it, we can measure it, 
with all this area. So that's our paradox of value in a nutshell. Okay, some final examples, some final questions to finish off. Let's see if you can work through these. Let's suppose we have the following demand curve. Price equals 50 minus one half quantity demanded. Okay, some questions. When the price is $20, how many units are being demanded in this market? Okay, so that's our first question. Second question, what is the marginal effect of a change in price of plus $1? Right, so change in price of plus $1. If price goes up by a dollar, by how much does our quantity demand change by? Very similarly, what is at this initial point here, what is the elasticity of demand if price were to change by plus one dollar? That is, if we were all of a sudden to end up at a price of 21, we would have some new quantity demanded. And what would be our elasticity of demand between these two points? Based off of this, we could finalize and say, okay, we've just had this change in price for given the change in price, does total expenditure increase or decrease? And then finally, to wrap it up, bring it all together, five, what is the total benefit received when price is $20? We could say finally six, graph, Typically, I would say, hey, even though number six would be to graph this, I would do this first so that you can visualize all of the rest. So, okay, at this point, I'm going to recommend you pause, you look at this, you work through all this, and then unpause and work through what my solution is. So, pause the video now. I'm going to jump and I'm going to start working through this. Okay, so as I said, first thing I want to do is graph this. So let's graph it. Visual person, I like to be able to see what I'm working with. So the graph helps me keep track of what my problem is actually at. So what do I have? First bit of information, what's my 50 minus one half quantity demanded? So let's put that in first. I'm going to have. 50 as my vertical intercept, and then I have a slope of one half. That is over here, I'm going to intercept at 100. Okay, so I have my line, that guy there, right? That had a slope of negative one half, well, not one half quantity demanded, one half, and that would have been rise over run, so price per quantity, if you wanted to think about it in that way. Okay, what do I have to start off? First question, when the price is 20, what is my quantity demanded? Okay, so when the price is 20, what is my quantity demanded? Let's just kind of visualize this. So maybe about there's 25, let's say that is 20. Okay, price is 20, and again, price equals 50 minus one half Q. What is my Q? Okay, let's plug in what I know. I know that I have a price of 20. 50 minus 1 half Q. Okay, again, I don't like these negatives. So I'm going to add 1 half Q to both sides. 20 plus 1 half Q equals 50. Take the 20 to both sides, so 1 half 
q equals 30. Get the q by itself, so times by 2, q equals 60. Okay, 20 to 60. Yeah, you know what? With my rough scale, right, it's not a perfect scale, but with my rough scale, yeah, that numerically lines up. So I, I would expect something like that. That's, that's not bad. That's not bad. What's my next question? What is the marginal effect of plus or minus one price or plus one dollar change in price, right? Well, okay, my marginal effect, again, I can get that is just the inverse of my slope. So I have a slope of negative one half. So my marginal effect is going to be two. Negative two quantity demanded per dollar. So every time I have a change in price of one dollar, my quantity demanded will change by two units. So I have my marginal effect. Great. Uh, what is the elasticity of demand if I have a change in price of one dollar? That is, if the price were to go up to twenty-one. Okay. I can cheat a little bit here. I can say, okay, price goes up to twenty-one. I know my marginal effect is price goes up by one, quantity demanded goes down by two. So my quantity demanded would be 58, right? Just using, just using my interpretation of the marginal effect, I can solve for that without going through all of the math and everything to go with it. So great, boom, I have that. I can then calculate my elasticity. So okay, elasticity of demand, I'm gonna invoke this version this whole change in Q over change in P times my average price, average quantity, because that's that, right? That's my marginal effect. So what do I get? Elasticity of demand is two times, what's my average price? I went from 20 to 21, 20.5 over my average quantity, I went from 60 to 58, that's going to be 59. So working through that, 20.5 divided by 59 times 2 gives me 0. Uh, 0. 0.69. So in my case there, I'm less than 1, I am inelastic. That is, I am not very sensitive to a change in my quantity demanded. Sorry, totally backwards. I'm not, my quantity demanded is not very sensitive to a change in my price. That is, every 1% change in my price gives me a 0.69% change in my quantity demanded. Price changes more than quantity demanded does. What's my next one? Given this change in price, does my total expenditure rise or fall? Okay, in this case here, I'm inelastic, so we could go redraw that diagram. We could also think about this as total expenditure is price times quantity. We just said we're inelastic, so quantity is not sensitive. Not sensitive to changes in price. What happened? Price went up. My quantity is not sensitive, so it went down, but just a little bit, right? Big increase, tiny decrease. The big overwins the small, so total expenditure goes up all together. Okay, we can double check that, right? We can double check why that's the case. Let's take a look at our diagram here. So we had something like this. Where we had there down, we had our elastic zone, we had our inelastic zone, and the relationship between quantity and total expenditure. We just said that we are dealing in our in elastic zone, right, 0 0.69, and quantity fell. So we went from something like that. No, oh, let's fix that. 
we went from something like that, quantity fell, to something like that. What happened to my total expenditure? Total expenditure went up, exactly as I forecasted. So, okay, we worked that through, and we saw another way we could think about this to solve that as well. So, relationship between quantity and total expenditure. What's my final bit here? Uh, okay, we worked through that. Number five, what is the total benefit received when price equals 20? So, okay, the total benefit received, that is all of that marginal benefit being aerated up. So, all the way to there, to there. That is, I am looking for this entire blue area underneath the graph. So, okay. Again, to be able to calculate that, we need to separate it into this triangle and this rectangle. Once we calculate each of these guys individually, we can add them together and get the total area. So to start off with the triangle there, one half base times height. Okay, what's my base? I have a base of 60. So. 60, my height, 20 to 50, I have a height of 30. What's the area of that rectangle? Well, that's going to be an area of $900. Over to the rectangle, though, base times height. Okay, base I've already worked out, that is 60. My height in this case is. 20. So 60 times 20 is going to be 1200. Altogether, what's my total benefit from consuming 60 units? Well, my total benefit, the total value I receive from consuming 60 units is going to be equal to 1200 plus 900. 2100, that is my total value total value of $2,100 being received from this consumption of 60 units. So all the different bits that we worked through in this chapter, we worked through interpretations of our demand curve, we worked through working out, hey, what's my value based off the formula, we worked out our total values, we worked out measures of sensitivity, all of that included in here. The only thing we didn't get to play with in this example is moving the curve around, that is by having a change in one of our determinants, income increased, change in the price of another good or one of those kind of situations. We already looked at an example of that. It gets messy to use those examples with numbers. We typically won't. Um, we'll typically either move the curves just generically or we'll deal with a numerical example. Very rarely will we do both combined. So bit of an overview, bit of an example. That wraps up our little section on demand. In the next video, we'll be taking a look at supply. We'll be looking at much of the same situation with that. Different interpretations of supply, elasticity, marginal effects, right? The same kind of sensitivities of supply. And we'll then finish that off and bring the two curves together to form our market. Until then.